Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so this in the session I'm doing is the last, last product I'm tasting, but you'll see this before all the wines because I don't want my palate blown out by this. All right, so backstory on this. So I went to a cocktail conference and I'll put a link uh, to the episode where I went to the Under the Big Top uh, event from cocktail conference and this was one of the uh, tables I visited and I had the cocktail from it. Now I had asked to try the spirit on its own and they told me the person who was pouring everything or making the cocktails was like, no, I'm not allowed to do that. Eh, I beg to differ. Uh, and this is not to badmouth them because plenty of these tables like were, no matter what the tasting thing is, whatever event it is, you'll get a lot of them say, well, I'm not allowed to do that. Well, now, that might be more like the company, whether this company or whoever told them don't do it, but I know, I know the cocktail conference isn't preventing them from doing it because I get the spirit on its own plenty of times over the years when I got on the cocktail conference. So it may be one of those things where they're really just trying to make sure that you don't have people getting like hammered and they're not saying they're not allowed to do it. They're more like they don't want to. And I totally get it. Like, because trust me, I do see people get inebriated at this thing. And I'm like the one guy that's spitting every time. Not every time, most of the time. Spitting, spitting a lot. Even though, like this year, I did Uber back and forth to a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> Especially like if I went to a night event. Because if I wanted to enjoy some of the cocktails, like as I got near the end of the event, I, I could do that without having to worry about driving home. All right. So, I went there. I asked to, asked to try the spear on its own. They said No. So I tried the cocktail and I was all excited and it was a really good cocktail. I, I liked it a lot. So then afterwards, after I turned off the camera and everything, there was a lady there who's a representative of sorts for them. I don't remember her name. I'm almost positive she gave me her card. I was looking for the card a few days ago. I can't find it. So I'm really sorry if, if you're finally watching this uh, and I don't remember your name or have your information. I'm so, so sorry. But anyway, my promise was I was going to review this and I made sure this is the first episode of this group rather than the last episode because I don't want to do it as the last thing. I don't want them to wait till like May. So, or like end of May to, to like see this. Plus all the stuff that was going on with advanced exam and kind of me not doing any more reviews for like the month of March. All right, so who is this? This is Barrel Craft Spirits. So this is their dovetail. And this is a whiskey finished in rum, port, and Dunn vineyards, like the winery, Cabernet Barrels. So this is a cask strength. They only made 248 bottles from this batch. The proof is 124.34 proof. That equates to 62.17% alcohol. So this is much later in May. This is like two months. This is actually June now. This is June, I guess. So hopefully all the COVID's done, but technically I could use this as hand sanitizer because it's at least 60% alcohol, even though they're really, they really mean isopropyl, like, but ethanol also counts. So technically I could use this as hand sanitizer if I wanted to. Remember this is April 4th I'm recording this, but I'm not going to. All right, so I got it for free. So thank you so much. I'm so excited to try this. So lots of different prices, but basically Wine Searcher, actually you can you can find spirits on there. I didn't realize that. Um, average is about 90 bucks for this bottle. This is not cheap stuff. This is definitely on that premium, ultra premium luxury level of, of uh, spirits. So I found in doing research, trying to find like retail outlets that sell it, 
I found prices as low as 85 bucks and as high as $98. And then Wine Searcher itself said, well, the average, which is kind of, it's kind of weird when you look at their average because it's not always an average average, is like $90. All right, so who's BCS, Barrel Craft Spirits? It was founded by Joe Beatrice. Uh, he was came from the tech industry in the 90s. Uh, he launched this in 2013 after doing some barrel tasting of whiskey, um, doing some barrel tasting of whiskey. Uh, instead of an actual distillery, what he does is he gathers exceptional casks from established producers to bottle whiskeys at cask strength. So the, the what this is from the website. It's similar to Scotland's independent bottlers. Um, at the time, this wasn't done at all or very widely in the U.S. Uh, I also think of this as kind of similar to a broker in Bordeaux, an uh, old school broker or kind of negotiant in Burgundy where the broker would like get the wines from the uh, from the chateau in Bordeaux and then they would bottle it. Uh, would, they would get it in cask and then they would bottle it themselves, possibly even doing their own blending. And then they would put like the name, you know, Chateau Margot on there or whatever. Now, <clears throat> since then, the broker doesn't really do it as much as they used to in Bordeaux. Really, almost everything is bottled at the winery and they do all the stuff at the winery. So, but this is kind of an idea. Like they get all the casks and they go, okay, well, we can make a blend of this and then we're going to name it whatever you want to name it, you know, using the BCS thing. Um, different than buying all the stuff from the big producer of whiskey in Indiana and then aging it yourself. So um, I'm not trying to make any association with that, with this, but it's like the dirty little secret of, of whiskey making that, and I'm not saying these are bad whiskeys. These are some like really good whiskeys and bourbons um, <clears throat> that are made by this huge distillery in, in, in Indiana. You know, a lot of this stuff is based upon, um, what should we call it? Uh, the aging process that's going on. So whiskey and bourbon and scotch, a lot of it is process driven like champagne rather than necessarily terroir driven or winemaking or, or, dis, or distilling. Well, that's definitely a big part of it in distillation. All right. So I get to try, I have the, I have my iPad as my monitor, like right there. At one point I might actually use my iPad as a teleprompter, but I haven't decided to do that yet. Not for this show, but for some other stuff that I'm planning on doing. All right. <clears throat> So they have a master distiller or blender. Uh, they, they describe him as both on the website. His name is Trip Stimson. He graduated from the Tennessee Technological University in 2004. He has a degree um, in biochemistry and molecular bi biology. He worked for quite a few people. Brown Foreman, you may know, uh, they produce Jack Daniels, Woodford Reserve, etc. cetera. Uh, and then the Kentucky Artisan Distillery, they are really famous for Jefferson's. Uh, so he... Worked with Jefferson's Groth Barrel Age, so like done, uh, and their Barrel Age Manhattan. And Jefferson's is outstanding stuff, okay? I'm not saying Woodford Reserve and JD is not really good stuff at Jefferson's. If you ever get a chance, their Ocean is really cool stuff. Uh, he also built the first malting operation in Kentucky in 2016. So I'm a little ignorant on some of this stuff with spirits, but I guess, you know, really in whiskey and bourbon, there's no malting involved, but scotch there is, right? Um, he started at BCS in 2017. So the, um, BCS creates, oh, creates, I'm like creates, creates, uh, a bourbon. They do bourbons, whiskeys, rye, and rums. Uh, they have six different special releases, which dovetail is one of them. And then let's see, uh, dovetail is blended to highlight some of our favorite. This is directly from the website. For our favorite flavors, I'm going to actually read the tasting notes. I'm not really worried about tasting this stuff. I mean, I'm tasting it, but I'm going to read their stuff. I don't normally do that with wine, but with spirits, sometimes I have a hard time picking up some of the nuances. So I'm going to let power suggestion work for me on this. Um, so some of our favorite flavors, woody bourbon, terroir driven Dun Cabernet, toasted French oak, late bottled vintage port pipes, black strap molasses casks. There will be proof variations with each bottling. So like when you look at the website, the proof uh, on the website of the bottle was like 122 proof. So yes, so let's uh, let's kind of talk about cask strength. Uh, we'll, we'll finish with, with the stuff in here. So 10 year old, so the whiskey is a combination of 10 year old whiskey, to st this was distilled in Indiana. Uh, some of it was. 
finished in Dunn Vineyard barrel, Dunn Vineyard Cabernet barrels, 11-year bourbon distilled in Tennessee, finished in Blackstrap rum cask uh, and LBV port pipes. Like I said about the Indiana things, lots of good bourbons and whiskeys are from that distillation. And these guys are being transparent. And I think that was in the, I maybe didn't put it in my notes, but I believe he, they, they, he wants transparency in what he's doing, which is awesome. Uh, it says, it's crafted and bottled in, te- in Kentucky. And then it says 122.9 proof cast strength bottling. But remember, this one is a different one. It's 124. What is cask strength? So there's a long definition and I believe I have a link to that. Maybe not. Um, but anyway, so cask. So a whiskey that has not been substantially diluted after its storage in a cask for maturation. The level of alcohol by volume um, strength for a cask strength whiskey is typically in the range of 58 to 66%. So double that for the, for the I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, ABV, 58 to 66% ABV. So this is at 62.17. You, know, uh, you double that for proof. Most bottled whiskey is diluted with water to reduce its strength to a level that makes it less expensive to produce and more palatable to the most consumers. So think about this. The water allows you to cut it, allows you to produce more of it so you don't have to charge as much. So rarity, I don't know how much of this is produced, but I guarantee you it's not like 100,000 cases or 200,000 or a million cases. Rarity is part of why things cost so much, whether it's whiskey, wine, beer, clothes, whatever. Um, so it's usually around 40% ABV, which is 80 proof. That's your standard, which is the statutory minimum in most countries, including here, um, for whiskey. Uh, the degree of dilution significantly affects the flavor and general drinking experience of the whiskey. So cask strength, though, is not the highest proof. That would be still strength, like from the still. And um, so pot stills will produce... Um, whiskey produced by pot still increases in strength with each distillation and is typically distilled to about 70% ABV. And column stills are able to producing much higher proof uh, levels. That's basically the, because of how those two things work. Uh, most distillers reduce the proof by adding water to the whiskey prior to casking it. That's why cask strength is not as high as still strength. Um, let's see. During aging process, proof levels can change depending on storage conditions. Uh, scotch usually doesn't change too much because they have a cooler climate and they're using used barrels. Um, usually stays the same or goes down in maturation. American bourbon whiskey is usually produced using new barrels and the storage conditions in Kentucky and Tennessee where nearly all of it's produced, though you can produce it elsewhere in the United States, um, allow the proof levels to rise during aging, angel share. So evaporation happens. So you have less, less alcohol to water ratio. So you get higher and higher alcohol level to water. So you get higher proof. Uh, let's see. I won't go through. Oh, well, so, so barrel proof. So we have, these things are regulated. So barrel proof um, is, along, among other terms, are regulated by the truth and labeling requirements. So whiskey can only be called barrel proof if the bodily proof is not less than 1% or 2 degrees U.S. proof lower than when the barrels were dumped at the end of the aging period. It also covers um, other phrases describing high proof whiskeys, including original proof, original barrel proof, and entry proof and are restricted to indicate that the proof of the spirits entered into the barrel and the proof of the bottled spirits are the same, I guess, within that range. All right. So how do you drink this stuff? So let's, let's, so you'll have people that go, I only drink it straight. They're like, well, I, I'll put a, I'll put like a really, really big ice cube, like a, like a square. I don't have those. Or they'll put like one or two, like smaller ice cubes in there, or they'll, They'll put a touch of water in it, um, or they'll do water and rocks. So you have a lot of people that are, that like, they drink it that way and that's the best way to drink it. So I'm drinking it straight because straight allows you to get the full effect without any dilution. Now, why would you dilute this stuff? Whether it's from ice, from the ice melting, and a big cube 
melts slower than a small cube, all right? Or putting a little bit of water in there, that, what that does, that helps release aromatics. Now, I don't really have, I mean, we have some bottled water at the house, but I'm not gonna put tap water in here. I'm just gonna drink it straight. But water, like a, a dash, like a couple drops of water, like if you really wanna get like, really, you can like use a dropper, but if you like just a dash of water in there, that will help with the aromatics, help with the flavors. It will dilute it a little bit, will make it more palatable, but it also reduces the strength, which you might actually want because this this stuff at cask strength or even still strength is powerful stuff. So it may not go down as smooth as it does if it's a little bit lower proof, because that's what dilution will do. Okay, so let's see here. Um, oh yeah, so barrel aging of uh, so barrel aging, so I'm going to go through some barrel aging stuff here. So scotch for a long time has used sherry barrels, port barrels, American bourbon barrels to age their, their scotches because it adds in parts certain flavors and characteristics. So it's really not a new idea. But there's crossover barrel aging techniques uh, that have expanding to wine and even beer. Now, wine using spirits barrels and beer using spirit barrels or wine barrels. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so in wine, you'll get with red wine, they'll, uh, of course you have new barrels already in part, uh, flavors and aromas. And a lot of times with, with red wines, especially if they use American oak, new American oak, uh, you'll get a lot of the same flavors and aromas that you get from a whiskey. They're called whiskey lactones. It's part of the whole thing with barrel aging. Whites a lot of times uses tequila because tequila apparently has a better flavor profile that matches with like white wine, especially like Sauvignon Blanc. I haven't had any of those yet, but I've seen Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc use tequila barrels rather than whiskey barrels or bourbon barrels. But I've also seen like Chardonnay with bourbon barrels. So for me, like with a red wine in those bourbon barrel ones, I've only had a few of them. They're not my, they're not my favorite. I had one that was okay, but to me, it's like you're already probably going to have the whiskey lactose. Why do I need to like put it to 11 or 12, right? I did have one that was like age like three months in a, in a bourbon barrel and I was like what was the point because you couldn't taste anything so it's kind of like hit and miss on these things they also because of these flavors they they have this like appearance of sweetness let's talk about sweetness so besides fruit forwardness and the right or condition of fruit in wine alcohol and more, more further than sorry that then residual sugar might be left in a wine like I one of the wines I reviewed I'm going to review <laughs> I've already done them, but you'll see eventually. Oh yeah, this 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 is um, yeah this this episode is not going to be done in June. This is like in like two weeks. Um, the hand sanitizer reference, but uh, there's almost always a little bit of residual sugar left over in wine. It might be like two grams per liter, and it's usually not perceptible. You know, below two grams ish, but um, some wines have like three, four, five, six, seven grams per liter of sugar left in there, or they may have added some sugar back in because sugar makes things taste better. Alcohol, the higher the alcohol, the sweeter something it will taste. So a 16% alcohol wine, will, if the same alcohol, I mean with the same um, uh, sugar, residual sugar, will taste sweeter than a 14% wine. So yeah, so to me, like all that is combined. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, alcohol, spirits, yeah, sweetness. Let's get into this. Let's get into this whiskey. So uh, they don't call it bourbon because it is not at least fifty-one percent uh, corn that was making bourbons, but it is whiskey. And I should have enough in there. So let's just kind of. So when you nose spirits, I'm gonna put a little bit more in here. When you nose spirits, you want to have your mouth open. You don't want to just like stick your nose in there and just like sniff because you're gonna just. You're just gonna smell alcohol, you're gonna burn, and you're not gonna smell anything, okay? So you kind of have your, have your nose kind of over and kind of breathe in through your mouth, and that way you're gonna get, you'll get, a, uh, you'll, get the, you'll get the aromas without like really getting the burn of the alcohol. So as almost every whiskey, in, especially bourbon and or whiskey, is going to have, you are going to get uh, a lot of caramel. Okay, that's just like a normal, that's just like a normal thing. And so we're combining whiskeys and bourbons 
Um, and since it's not the final product is not 51% corn, you can't call it bourbon. But you definitely get that, and you get a bit of corn out of it. So a lot of times with bourbon, you can actually kind of smell and smell and taste the corn. And there's a bit of sweetness to it. Caramel, vanilla, whiskey lactones, right? Brown sugar. Oh, yeah. Here we go. The tasting notes from the website. I haven't even gone through it. So they're like mature aromas of both sweet, cannelli, panna cotta, okay, maybe, creme de noyo, savory, walnut, oil, and leather. I don't know if swirling actually really does anything with spirits. Not really on that. Uh, followed quickly by a vast array of fruit derived from both the spirit, smoked apricot, grapefruit peel. Apricot I can see. As well as the cast treatment, slow gin, damson jam. I, I don't have, I don't know idea what damson jam smells like or even tastes like. And I've almost never had slow gin on its own. So, almost high tone, pungently floral and herbaceous. I, I was going to say herbaceous before I started reading this. With subtle balancing pops of minerality. That's, I don't do enough spirits to know what minerality on the spirit will do. Palette. All right. There's a reason I did this last and why this is going to be the first thing you're going to see besides my the last week's episode, which is like my, what I did for three months. Woo. So it's potent and that's why I'm going to read their, their tasting notes because I don't have enough experience really tasting spirits to really do evaluation of spirits. But I mean, first of all, yeah, you taste the alcohol, but I get like orange. Like orange peel, like orange itself, like almost like, I mean, like Cointreau and stuff like that, Grand Marnier, um, caramel, butterscotch. Um, there's also a, like a salinity to it, a savoriness to it. It is potent, so when I'm breathing in, even though I spit out, there's still the residual alcohol in there. Butterscotch, caramel, that kind of stuff. But that's all I'm getting, so there's gonna be more complexity here. So let's go here. Cocoa, mol molasses, burnt marshmallow, maybe? It says darker. And spicier, cola, nutmeg, telecherry, peppercorn. I have no idea what that is. Nutmeg, I can kind of see that. Uh, oh, darker and spicier than the nose. An effect well complemented by the cask treatment and rendered more complex by the savory and herbaceous themes running throughout. I can kind of get that savory and herbaceous, but it's really faint and it's probably more power suggestion. I'm not saying it's not there, it's just I don't have enough experience. Finished, a sweet and elegant signature of rose, jelly, chestnut, honey, and pinot de Char charentes. Maybe on that. Hazelnut, yes. Eucalyptus, no. Corsican mint, I could, I don't know about Corsican mint, but I can see the mint on that. Maybe it's because I'm thinking mint julep now, and bourbon is the main ingredient besides mint of mint julep. So the secret is breathe through your nose instead of your mouth that you don't get all that burn. I guess the honey, but the, the pin, Pinot de Char, Charentes, I haven't had a lot of those in the past, but I kind of get that. I kind of get that. And the hazelnut, more of a nuttiness rather than the hazelnut itself. 
But when I think about hazelnut, I'm also thinking about um, Frangelico. So I can kind of see that. And it says, with a few drops of spring water, an unexpected avalanche of orange and tropical notes of watermelon, lychee, and vanilla on the nose. While I'm not doing any water, I don't have any spring water. It's tasty, man. It's tasty. Now, would I normally drink this on its own at this strength? Probably not. One, I'm just not used to drinking it like this. I probably would put on the rocks and let, and it'd be just regular, you know, wine, I mean, regular ice from tap water. But I would probably put on the rocks and let the rocks kind of like just really kind of smooth it and calm it down a bit. But is this good stuff? Yeah. Can I tell the difference between this and maybe something else that's like 90 bucks or maybe something that's like 50 or 60 bucks or 30 bucks? Probably. It's raining outside, by the way. It's been raining all day. A little thunder. I don't know if you heard that. And if it's during the day. Like, it's, since it's cloudy and, and rainy all day, I don't know about And it's like, and right now the sun would be coming directly through the window. It's great because I, I got to keep total control over lighting. Um, and I'm not doing this at 3 in the morning, which I'm really happy about. As far as it feels cast strength versus cast strength, could I tell the difference between different levels of quality? Maybe. I don't have enough experience with that. It's like asking somebody who doesn't drink a lot of wine to tell the difference between a $100 bottle of wine and a $20 bottle of wine. To them, it's going to taste the same. But I don't know of many $20 or $30 bottles of whiskey that are cask strength. So yeah, I, I could tell the difference, mainly because of the power. But there's a richness to this. I mean, I've had lots of whiskeys and bourbons at multiple price points. And there's definitely a richness to it. There's You, you can tell that there's there's a quality level that's making it that 90-ish dollars. It's good stuff, man. Now, I also think that most of the stuff that's at this price point is all gonna taste good. It's kinda like a $100 bottle of wine is gonna taste quality level, not the same necessarily, but quality level. $100 bottle of wine, if you have like four of them, they're all gonna taste good. They're all gonna taste expensive. $50 bottle of wine, they're all gonna taste expensive. Now, there might be one you prefer over another. Same thing with this. Like, I like this, but there might be another bottle, of, like maybe from them or some other producers, 90 bucks, that I may not like as much or I might like better. But I like it. Okay. One, because it's the last of, of everything tonight. So that I'm actually going to record my recap <laughs> next and sip on something after dinner. Actually, I'm going to have dinner after this. Um, considering how high in alcohol it is, it actually went down pretty smooth. It was actually better to swallow it than to leave it in my mouth. Considering it's, you know, 122 ABV, 124 ABV, uh, pro, sorry, proof, it's going to 62 62 proof versus 40 proof, it did really go down kind of smooth. It's good. All right. That's it for tonight, or at least for the reviews. And uh, I've linked to these guys down below. Um, yeah, I'm not, I read to you all the stuff about barrel aging and cask aging. I'm not going to put a link to where I found that. Uh, you can find it on your own if you want. But yeah, uh, it's it's under Barrel Bourbon. That's the link for these guys. And because uh, it's Barrel and they do make bourbon. This is technically not a bourbon, it's a whiskey. But yeah, I mean, distilled in Indiana, Tennessee. I mean, they're, they're definitely, they're definitely um, transparent on it, which is outstanding. Thank you so much to the lady who gave me this. I'm so sorry. I don't have your information. I lost it. And I feel really embarrassed to buy that. Um, but thank you to her and Joe and Trip and the other people that you can find on the website. She wasn't on the website. I was hoping I would see her on the website. But yeah, uh, this is exciting because this is my first actual like straight up just spirit review that I didn't have somebody involved with the distillery sitting next to me. <laughs> Not that that influences me, but it's cool to do it just on its own where I can just kind of riff and do whatever I want. But I also do that when I have the winemaker in front of me. 
I mean, I give my honest opinion. All right, it's good stuff. Links, links, PayPal, ducats, be safe, social distance yourself, wash your hands, don't be touching your face all the time, like I do. Yeah, if you wanna wear a mask, wear one. I'm not gonna get into the debate about it. If you wanna wear one, do it, man, I don't care. Except that just make sure your, your healthcare workers have a supply. That's really the biggest thing about that one. Um, yeah, and we'll get through this, man. And I'm lucky that I, I already mentioned this last week, but I'm going to mention it again. I am lucky because I actually still have a job job because I'm considered essential in what I'm doing. Whereas a lot of my brethren who are in the restaurant industry don't. And I mean, the managers, a lot of them still, like if I was still at Morton's, I would still be working because they have the takeout and to-go stuff. But a lot of my friends who are hourlies, and even some of the, my manager friends and other concepts that didn't stay open, you know, I hope all of you are able to get through this. You know, maybe you have to get a part-time job somewhere. Uh, I know it sucks about about all this. I'm not going to go through because I, I should talk about it last week. But hope all of you are doing as well as possible. And uh, we'll get through this. And, you know, drink some good stuff while you're at it. We'll see everyone again next time.